Hi, and welcome to the conversation series from the Composer Wellbeing Collective. I'm Emily Richardson. I'm a composer agent and music supervisor and a founding member of the Composer Wellbeing Collective, which is a new non-commercial initiative committed to raising awareness and increasing impartial support for the well-being of composers and music creators, with a focus on positive conversations around mental well-being. Check out our website, Instagram and Twitter pages for details on the next conversation. And please do get in touch. We would love to hear from you. Every voice helps to open up the conversation around composer well-being. Today, we are discussing support networks and the role of the agent. Um, before we get into it, I do just want to say um, that we're not promoting having an agent um, in this conversation. Um, it's not for everybody. Um, different people uh, like to create different support networks around them. Sometimes that includes an agent, sometimes that doesn't. Um, and it really is up to the individual composer as to um, what they feel is the best for their career. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have made it or not made it if you've got a composer or not. Um, it's just another way of supporting your career and your progression um, and helping in, in that sort of way, um, whether you need it or, or not. Um, so with that in mind, <laughs> uh, today we're talking to Ashling Brewer, who is a composer, producer and pianist. Maggie Rodford, who is Managing Director of Airedale, a music supervisor, producer and composer agent. And Hamish Duff, who is a composer agent and artist manager. So to kick off, um, Maggie, would you mind giving us um, sort of the bare bones of what a composer agent does? Um, and how you how you ended up being a composer agent yourself? <laughs> um, thank you uh, for the introduction. Um, so maybe if I start with um, how I became a composer agent, which then in a way feeds into some of um, the other points that um, will come in the next part of the answer. Um, I. Um, was studied music at school. Um, that was my great love. Um, um, always wanted to do what my dad did, and he was a music engineer. Uh, he very sadly died when I was very young, and but I was determined to be a music engineer at the BBC. And so I managed. I uh, joined the BBC as, as a trainee um, production secretary, and had a wonderful training as a basic on the on the, those basics and was given the hint that if I sort of was able to join the BBC then I could apply internally for their um, engineers course which is what they call studio managers so sort of cut to five years later I'd been working in um, as a studio manager across all of Radio 1 and 2 um, live music recording um, so with hundreds of different artists um, as an assistant and then as an engineer myself and it was just when technology was taking off so um, it was the sort of multi-track recording was just coming in obviously a younger person being in in the studio at that time you absorb that information more quickly perhaps and so I was given fantastic opportunities and then through that um, our head of department was actually headhunted by EMI to start a broadcast programs company for EMI and I was um, asked if I would like to join EMI from the BBC. So um, myself and three colleagues um, left and helped start this broadcast programs company and that was when I really started sort of in inverted commas producing um, because there I was engineering our own sessions but also producing them as well and we were making content the idea being for commercial radio but in fact the first program that I produced was the Everly Brothers story that went out on BBC Radio 1 and it was the first program that the BBC ever took from an outside producer um, so it is a long time ago, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but that took me into the world of production because I had the opportunity, we did all the in-flight programming for British Airways as one of, uh, one of our clients and that included live music recording for them um, and through that I was able to use the studios at Abbey Road which I was allowed to engineer myself in um, and um, it, it was it was a, a 
it was a very intense three-year period where um, we got involved in so many different things that I had so many opportunities of working with different artists, um, commissioning new recordings, using different techniques for, um, it was the time when Concord was flying, that dates it all for you. Um, but we, we managed, we got a chance to really produce in the studio in a way that was for me very, very exciting and working with artists. Um, and we got to the point where uh, it was, it, things were being reviewed internally at EMI and um, it was tough because there were only six commercial radio stations. So there wasn't a huge market. Um, so the, I started looking around and um, I was introduced by the then managing director of Abbey Road um, to Air Studios to one of the directors there. And that's how I came to have a, um, a, an interview with Air Adele and I joined as a junior producer. So that, at that time, Air Adele represented eight or nine composers, mainly in the area of commercials. And we were very, very, very hands-on working with the composers. So as, this leads on to what we do today <laughs> um, as agents. Um, our role was absolutely being the, the person who could take all of the admin side and parts of the production side for the composer so that they could concentrate on the writing um, and, and the recording process. Um, we looked after everything else between the agency and between the composer. And then obviously our our side of the business changed very much at the encouragement of, in fact, Stanley Myers, who was one of our composers who I worked very closely with on lots of big orchestral commercials. And he said, how come you guys don't do this for feature film and television? Because we, we kind of need this interface. We need someone who can understand what we need and negotiate the deal and then be able to help us deliver it. So I've always used that really as how I feel the role of the agent should be, which is a support for the composer. So allowing the composer to, to spend as much time as they, they can on the creative side. And we look after anything administrative for them, budgeting, um, hands-on in the, in the studio, organization on the studio side if they if they want that so some of our projects um, and some of the work we do we, we might just be negotiating the deal um, and obviously in the first place helping to get the deal in the in through the door so there's a sale a big sales element of what we do um, and um, having that sales element is key to obviously keeping the workflow for, for everyone. And then there's the negotiating side. And then there's very much the support side of all the way through the process and being there if the schedules change, you know, being there if there's budget issues, being there if there's creative issues. Um, so I, I see the role of agent as being very all encompassing and absolutely a support and to really try and help make the process for the composer the smoothest and most joyful that it can be because music's jo joyful um, and the, the process should be as happy and as um, uh, joyful is the right word really uh, as joyful as possible given that everyone is working under phenomenal pressure um, and and I think that's what sometimes gets forgotten is that the pressure is huge because creatively there's the pressure of the filmmakers and and the time scale and the budget so there's a lot of areas that need to to be supported Hamish, I wonder if um, you're, I know you, you have a slightly different background to Maggie, so um, I wonder if you can just tell us about a bit about how you got to be a composer agent and um, if you find that, that the experience is the same for you. It's interesting, Maggie, that you say um, back when you first started, 
I imagine that I think that the, the industry wasn't as saturated as it is now. And there was probably less of a sales element to being an agent. Um, but now that is quite a large part of it. Um, in fact, almost all of it, uh, uh, for, for me anyway, because I am an agent for some composers, um, that is a large part of what I do is, is going out there and trying to get the work in. And that I feel like that is um, a very big expectation from composers when, when you take them on. Um, that you are going to be going out and finding the work is that is that what you find as well Hamish? Yeah I mean um, it's interesting I mean, I, I'll, I'll give you a quick background of how I came to be an agent and and then answering that question um, so I come from you know the more commercial music background I started off in the live industry um, actually working in tour management and tour production um, and you know tour managing artists uh, is a very different uh, dynamic, um, which we could maybe touch upon later. But um, and then, sort of in my mid twenties, realised I didn't really want to be on the road for the rest of my life. Um, so started to look at other opportunities, and I really just started managing bands, like um, and unsuccessfully initially, but learning kind of as I went along, um, and then to sort of help supplement my my life here in London, I took on other jobs um, specifically in sync and licensing and uh in, in, in within publishing and that really kind of opened my world to 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 that side of, of the business and then over the course of a number of years through different roles um the two worlds started to combine with management and and publishing and and specifically sync um started to realize that a lot of the same contacts that i was approaching for sync were the same people that would be approached for original composition and uh, kind of quite organically started to manage artists that were writing music to picture um, so it was very much started from a manager's perspective and then the more I got into this particular space I realized that this is kind of what I wanted to do is on a personal level and you know I've always been fascinated by about music to picture it's always been a big passion of mine and then I found myself now kind of involved in the process so then started to take on people as an agent rather than a manager, which is a lot more of an all-encompassing role and obviously a lot more time intensive. So, so then I started to build up the roster. Um, I was working at an independent management company based in Bermondsey for a number of years. And then in 2000 and well, last year, 2019, uh, joined forces with US talent agency, First Artist Management, who are one of the kind of longer um, standing independent composer talent agencies based in LA to help set up and manage their UK operation. So it's all relatively new and now I'm the sort of uh, point person for the UK projects for their roster over here. So just giving that as a bit of a background, I definitely like feel that my experience as sort of an artist manager, um, it, you know, I, I, I can see a blurring between the, the roles between manager and agent and inevitably I've kind of sit between the both of them still and I still manage it um, two particular artists and um, you know the, for me like the breakdown is you know this is a very broad breakdown but a manager's role really if we you know looking at it is to get the best out of the talent to work with them to support them to get the best out of the talent an agent in a traditional sense and we'll come on to composer agent in a second but an agent is to get working you know that that's their role really and but with in the composer agent um, dynamic it is a slightly different situation because a lot of the composers don't have that support network that individual manager or assistant or whatever it is and so the the agent will then take on part of that responsibility and i see it across my roster now where a lot of my roster have managers so they take on a lot of the a lot of that particular work and then there's other composers uh, who don't have managers and I will take on a bit of the management responsibility and it's a kind of quite an organic um, approach to it, but I feel that it's needed to help support that composer and to get them, you know, to help progress their career, which is ultimately what we'll, all our roles are, you know, is to, is to, is to help, um, help push that forward. So I see there's a bit of a blurring between, between the two and, um, and I definitely feel like as an agent, the response, you know, a lot of the responsibility does fall on us when 
those composers don't have those support networks necessarily in place. Now, I think it's really interesting actually to um, to actually boil down what the differences are between a manager and, a, and a, an agent. And I think in the in the sort of classical um, and media composition world, an agent does take on quite a lot of that what would traditionally be a manager role in in yeah. a sort of pop. That's taken on by the the composer agent in the in the sort of media composition and classical world. Um, I um, yeah, I think um, it's really interesting that um, we have you to sort of sort of talk about the bridges between those things. Actually, um, Ashling, what network have you built up around you as a composer, and um, and what made you decide to have an agent as part as part of that network? It's kind of interesting also to 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 hear the other side of of the of the coin, as it were, um, because I I always kind of struggled with defining all the different roles that people have within a team. And I always thought that composers just worked completely alone, you know, and then you realize the more you get into it that actually there's an entire team of people that are all, you know, have different roles in supporting them, um, but also kind of learning where the lines are of what you can expect from people around you. And I kind of started in composing and then the artist side came later. Um, and it's not, I think, until with, with my duo Ava Waves that became an artist project, I realized the difference between a manager and an agent because you actually don't, you, you don't necessarily know where the line is of what you can expect from your agent when you first get one as a composer. Um, and I guess, I mean, I haven't come across many composers that have a manager before having an agent. It, it's just that the agent kind of tends to get involved with your career in a way that they kind of end up being your manager. And it was only with, with the band and we got a manager for that. That was like, oh, hang on a second. They are different things. And I think it also lifts some pressure off the agents as it were. I mean, Hamish, I don't know if you disagree with me, but if, if there is another person involved, then at least, you know, you can kind of delegate different things to different people. Um, I think when I first started, there was quite a pressure in a sense to, to show that you had an agent and it was kind of, you know, when you're starting off in the industry and you want to say to people, oh, you know, this is my agent, but you kind of don't know how to get an agent at the beginning or how to, how to get someone interested. And yet now I think there are so many you know, very successful composers who do not have an agent at all. And in fact, it's not necessary. But I did feel as a composer, like there was a certain expectation that if you joined a roster, it meant you'd be getting a certain kind of work and you'd be, you know, you'd, you'd kind of climbed up a level, as it were. Um, and then after getting an agent, although I have a very, very good relationship with my agent and I love her, but you also realize that a lot of it just kind of blends over because you build the connections with people as well. And so it's not always the agent that brings in work. And, you know, sometimes it is just stuff that has evolved through your career um, and the agent complements that. Um, so I, I recognize what you guys are saying. It's like, oh, sometimes there's pressure from the composer that they expect once, you, once you've joined an agency, like, oh, great, now I'm going to get all the work. It's all gonna, you know, it's all gonna come in, um, which isn't particularly fair on the agents, probably either, you know. Um, but I think in terms of support support network always, and this is something that has, you know, evolved with me personally over the years, is that I personally felt in the beginning you didn't want to, you didn't want to get too personal or show if you were struggling. Um, you know, to cope with the amount of work or to cope with the uncertainty of maybe not getting work or losing a pitch or, you know, just kind of all of the mental processes you go through as a composer. In the beginning, I was more wary of sharing those with anyone other than composers, really, because you didn't want to be like, oh gosh, now, you know, they're going to approach someone else next time because that person can't really deal with it or doesn't really know you know, how, how to process this. So we're going to go with the easy one. And 
I think a lot of composers tend to have that feeling at the beginning where you're kind of like, well, where do you draw the line between having a professional relationship, but also just talking together as humans and being honest with each other and having a more personal relationship. And that's something that I'm very grateful to now have with my agent is that, you know, that develops over time, obviously. But then nowadays, I feel like you, it's, it's much more open. It's much more, yeah, just, just honest, I think in that sense um, and you can recognize that you're all just humans trying to do the best job that you can and at the end of the day you're working towards the same goal and that kind of brings brings you back together again. Ashley you've got a um, your situation is that your uh, your agent and your publisher are within the same umbrella um, yeah. and that's something that's um, interesting to me because I've done I've I've been under both things I've been an agent and I've also worked for a publisher and and sometimes um your your sync team at your publishing company can actually sort of do the job of a composer in a composer agent in terms of the sales aspect um and and pitching you out for uh, composition work um I was wondering Maggie when you work with other publishers what what sort of relationship do you have with them with the with the publishers that your composers assigned to we I mean, a good relations, relationships, because obviously, uh, as it, every deal is different. Um, very often, obviously, if there's a, a film company or a major TV company involved, it may well be the TV company or the film company's publisher that we're um, working with, because those are the terms of the contract. Um, and, you know, every deal has to be looked at individually and as well in terms of whether it makes the most sense for the composer um, for the overall terms. But we have good relationships with all the publishers. I mean, it's at the end of the day, we all want the, the best for the film and we want to make the, or the, or the TV or the game, whatever. Um, and there are different terms with, with different companies. So you just have to kind of get, make sure that it's the best deal that can be done, but be, you know, mindful of, what the the production company side is in terms of what they have to del deliver to their distributor or to their platform, whatever. So um, I think it's just being aware, very aware of what everybody is having to consider in terms of making the deal. Um, but we have good relationships and we're talking with publishers all the time. So, um, Ashley, do you think? Um do you sometimes think that maybe your sync team could do the job of a composer agent or do you think it's important to have both? I think initially, so I, I actually joined um, them for publishing before they were my agent. And um, again, it was kind of like, you do feel like a lot of lines blur over because if they're at a meeting or they're at an event and they're talking about you, you know, obviously also trying to sell you as a composer just in general for being on their roster or for publishing. And that also kind of blends over into getting work. And I've always done a lot of bespoke stuff. So it was more of a natural transition that then I joined the agency. But saying that, I do speak to different people on the team depending on, um, on what it is people are after. So I would say there's one particular person, I would say it's my agent that I speak to the most and have a much more personal relationship with. And then there's the sync team that all support that. And also sometimes will just give me a ring and they're the ones saying, oh, we need this and that from you. Um, but there is still kind of, kind of a difference. So I think on the one hand, yeah, probably, but it depends on the agent itself, I think as well, how much they blur the lines in, in what they're doing and how many different aspects of a composer they're managing. I think, you know, the, 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 the ultimate answer is there's no right answer for, for everyone. It's not, it's not a one size fits all. You know, I think each individual composer, talent, whatever you want to call them, uh, has a different set of scenarios and needs a different set of solutions ultimately. And I think, um, you know, from my perspective, um, the best scenarios are when there's a team all firing in the same direction, when we've got a strategy that's working and we're all aiming for that same goal, working together. And when that works, it's amazing. And when that does work, from my perspective, I, you know, I'm probably more of the mindset of 
the more people that are involved that are working in that direction, the better. So I would usually probably say an agent and a publisher having been separate. Um, they have both have separate, obviously, re responsibilities. I mean, but I, I, you know, I do understand that sometimes that's not possible and it doesn't necessarily work for everyone. But, you know, if, if, we're, if I'm out, you know, shouting about a particular composer and then the publisher is also pitching their tracks for a sync and we're both aiming at the same music supervisor, then, you know, they've got that's two opinions, two people shouting that same person to, to, the, to, the, to the person we're all targeting and it's only going to help you know, get that work in. So that's been my mindset, certainly when I've approached it with a more, with a management perspective, when I'm looking across everything with the composer and what we're trying to achieve, you know, we'll then select the right team members based on where we're trying to get to and what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, I think, um, I think coming from both sync and a composer agent background, I think, um, I think it really depends uh, it, as a composer. I think it depends on what, what role you're looking for someone for someone to, to do for you because i think as a sync team if it's just pitching you out for work i think a sync team is probably sufficient um if you were if you wanted to get one or the other i think a sync team is probably sufficient to pitch you for work for bespoke jobs um that's sort of what it's called when you're a sync team you know bespoke work um because they're already in touch with the with the producers and the people that would need to be being spoken to anyway by the by the agent but i think when you bring an agent in i think it's a much more specific job that they do and as maggie was saying you know a sync team is not going to book you an orchestra or book you studio time or book you an engineer and that, those are all the things that an agent will do um and i think maggie I, I mean could you talk to us a little bit more about those sort of aspects of what the agent does um, and how that supports the composer it, it is very important every composer works in a a different way and likes to have support in a different way and I think part of our role as agents is understanding what each person wants and would like and we you know would never force a situation on someone um, so it's very much um, it's a very bespoke arrangement for each composer <laughs> um, and understanding you know which contractors that they like to work with which studios they like to work with which engineers they work like to work with but um, I mean, how we, we support um, the composer is that if they would like us to, you know, once we've, doing the deal is obviously getting the work in first and foremost, then doing the deal. Part of doing the deal, I always like to look at if it's a package deal, how, how is that going to work given the brief of the music? And to make sure that the composer and us understand how, that the fee of the package will be split between the, what the composer will retain and what would become costs for the production. And I actually find that's really helpful for the composers. It gives them peace of mind that there's going to be income from it. Um, so in terms of sort of mental well-being, understanding that, that you're working, but you're financially there is going to be some income and that's you're, you're comfortable with that takes a huge amount of stress away straight away and i think it, that is a really important thing to do and then working on the sort of if you like the production budget side we'll look at various different scenarios about you know different studios different uh, lineups um what a, sometimes co contacting key musicians that the composer wants to work with who are named artists and putting those deals together for them making sure that everything that contractually they're required to do in terms of how other artists are contracted is complied with um, i think you know it's it's important for the composer that the, the package deals are very often framed in such a way that an enormous amount of responsibility is put on the composer by the production company in terms of all the deliverables um, everything that's that the composer is supposedly going to have time to do as well as write the score and, and so we'll we'll try and ensure that anything that we we can help with we will then look after for them so you know practical things like phoning around the studios and finding availability talking with the contractor um, trying to help finalizing lineups um, bringing a team on board sometimes if it's a project where 
there's other um, members needed like orchestrator, who the copyist is going to be, Are there an, is there an assistant needed? Uh, sometimes there's a last minute phone call, we need some help track laying, can you find us someone who can come and help us? Um, you know, it's being there as a, um, a, a it's almost like being an, an assistant. Um, and but having a sort of an overview over the whole project and really being able to help wh whatever's needed. Um, and sometimes it's logistical as well. Um, so it's just the pure logistics of this is the amount of time that there is for the project, you know, to write the project. What, what, when are the recording dates? How are we going to achieve it? Um, and then looking at any issues. So sometimes it's, you know, you the composer starts working on a project, um, the director starts talking about enormous orchestras <laughs> and the budget in no way supports that. And so sometimes the conversation is, you know, we'll be talking with the producer at that point saying, we need to look at the budget realistically, um, you know, the overall level of the package that was negotiated would have been fine if we'd stuck to the original brief <laughs> but now the brief has expanded and and I kind of find that you know the more open and um, more information that you give a producer at that point on behalf of the composer that you know how the break the budget is breaking down what the studio costs are the fact that the musicians are x amount of money um, then we're in the position of helping perhaps sometimes get some additional money in for the for the production element of the of, of the project um, so I guess it's it's I think the agent can be is an enormous support element and picking up the point earlier about management yes the, I think in our field of music to picture there's a huge crossover between whether it's an agent or a management role and that's the nature of 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 the media, I think, more than anything else. Um, I, I completely agree. And I think sometimes, um, I think sometimes like the, the most simple thing that an agent can do is just have those awkward conversations with the, with the producer or whoever the person who's making the film is. Um, I've, I've had situations where a composer has said, oh, you know, I, I don't think they're paying me enough. And I, and I sort of say, just leave it with me. That's my job to have that conversation. Because yeah. I think in some ways it's you, I mean, obviously, you, as a as an agent, you don't want to ruin relationships with producers. But I'm I'm far happier to have awkward conversations than maybe the composer is, because actually, most important relationship is between the composer and the producer, and um, and that's sort of where the agent bridges the gap and has those conversations and those negotiations yeah. and sort of takes control of that sort of area. Um, even if they don't go on to sort of manage the project in, in that much detail, that can be something that an agent can really help with and reduce the stress of that. Um, you know, like like we're like we're saying, the the, the job of the, comp the composer is to be a creative. That like that's what that's what they're there for. That's what they're being employed for. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, their strengths are, are often not in you know hard hard sales and hard negotiations. You know, so that that's really what an agent should be there to help with. Um, Ashling, is that the experience that you've had with your agent, and and how has it helped you sort of in terms of your stress levels and overall well being as a composer? Yeah, I mean, 100% everything that was just said to me, that is one of the biggest added values is having someone in between to have those conversations. Um, because I, I also think it's very um, conducive to a better work environment and working relationship with the director. Um, if you can kind of step aside from those conversations. And, you know, I've had it before, before I had an agent where I was, you know, trying to have those hard conversations unsuccessfully probably and trying to you know say no that this is how much I should get paid but at the same time you you're very wary that you don't want to um kind of bring anything negative into the working relationship either and so you don't want to go too hard and it, it that's the thing is like you it, it's so valuable to have someone who just does the kind of hard business side um of the job with someone um and i've i've loved every aspect about that and also in terms of admin also in terms of making sure that the contracts are right that everything's registered that you're working with the musicians that if you do sessions everything's cleared you know it's like all those little things that i don't think i even 
realized how much time it was taking me until there was someone else who kind of was just like, give me all of that. And he was like, mm -hmm. oh my God, like I can just write now. This is amazing. <laughs> And so for me, like that was 100% one of the easiest sells um, of having an agent because I was just like, well, it's a no brainer. And the fact that I now actually spend so much more of my time actually writing music and I feel like I can be more creative is something I can't imagine giving up easily at this point, definitely. It's funny because we had in, a, um, in our last week's conversation, we had Sagan Akinola and he was talking about all the different roles a composer is expected to do. Accountant, manager, composer, um, all these sort of things. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's true that having a, an agent can help with, with those sort of things. What I would be interested to hear about actually, Hamish, is because um, we were talking about the, the stress that that can cause. As an agent, what sort of stress does that cause you, um, having <laughs> all those hats on behalf of your composers? Well, yeah, I mean, um, I think like any walk of life, there's, you have individual stresses, you know, I think it, it's, it's not just, you know, obviously we're talking specifically about music and music to picture here, but you know there are individual stresses in every role that you have and of course i have anxieties about things you know when you're negotiating a deal and you're hoping it's going to go through and you're having to sleep on it waiting for their response you know there's little things like that i mean there's a lot of things that i do individually to try and combat that and i've learned that through my own life not necessarily my own professional life but you know there's a lot of things i try and implement in my daily schedule to just help my own well-being and you know i've it's certainly helped me um and you know sometimes you know when i'm speaking to the talent that we work with as well i've always you know especially if they have questions about that kind of thing i'll always try and offer the advice that i have from a personal level and if that helps them in any way then great um um so yeah i mean there is there, yeah there is definitely those uh, stresses what are the what specifically do you do <laughs> do you give them <laughs> Well, good, good question. I mean, I think there's, there's, I said there's, there's two, there's two things. I mean, kind of picking up from what um, Maggie and Ash were saying about, um, which said, you know, about the role of the agent within that um, dynamic, and they explained it very well, both of them about, you know, where the, what the work the agent does behind the scenes and um, how they're a sort of protective barrier really for the talent, the composer, and I think that. Um, it's something that I'm always quite aware of in the way that I will communicate with the composer. You know, there's, there's certainly, you know, the, the, being the protection to the, you know, product producers or the studio, whoever it is, but also just the way that, you know, ultimately you we need the composer, you know, wants to get them to do the work, get it delivered and do it in a way where they're happy and have a self, you know, and, and, and uh, in their own you know, self-satisfaction. So I'm always trying to look at ways of, you know, how can you encourage the composer, you know, giving them the right advice at the right time, protecting them and shielding them from maybe negative comments, which is something that I've certainly learned from management and tour management as well. That's a big thing to try and reduce the anxiety um, from happening is by protecting them and being that shield. And, you know, I think that can go in many different levels. Um, you know, being honest and transparent, um, you know, I think is something that I've, always try to install in myself across everything and I think that it's you can avoid a lot of anxiety by not you know by just being honest and being clear about things um, and then on the kind of more I guess the just more practical ideas um, about how you know as I say I'm only really going on my own personal experiences but you know taking regular breaks going for walks I mean a lot of stuff that is probably quite obvious but I think sometimes people you know, just it needs to be people need to be reminded of it. Um, you know, healthy diet, fitness, obviously those those things that come with with everyday life. But um, you know, yoga and meditation. If you've got the time and inclination to do that, I think that that's really helped me um, in my life. And I totally swear by it. I feel like you know, being being mindful about um, in your own self I can, can really help both the creative process, but also. Um, your own well-being um, so that's something that I'll always encourage and I can obviously help you know share my experiences with with people 
Um, and because a lot of the time, you know, the reality is people have to take on these approaches themselves as an individual. And so I will, you know, I guess, you know, on, you're trying to help encourage that and um, try and make the environment for them to be able to do that as a, as a part of it. <clears throat> I think um, it's, I agree with everything you're saying completely. I think from, from my experience, it's also quite a new mentality now finally, you know, getting into the composing world that we do need to look after ourselves better. And I think for a long time, it was kind of expected that it's that you do all nighters, you don't go outside much. And, you know, that's kind of just the nature of the job that you have mental deadlines and you take on all of this stress and you internalize it and it wasn't talked about enough what that does to someone or you know uh, it, it just wasn't really a topic from from what i remember and recently it, it i'm so glad that it has kind of been brought to light more and there's more people but i think it's not even just in the music industry but all around where people have kind of gone oh gosh, you feel so much better if you go outside every now and again. <laughs> you feel so much better if you sleep or if you eat healthy or if you try and stick to a routine. And it's a conversation I've had with a lot of composers and also yoga and meditation, 100%, um, that are now implementing that and then finally seeing what a difference it can make and that it doesn't need to be part of the job to sacrifice your mental health just in order to just uh, in order to keep your head above water and be more competitive than the next composer or to get a job over someone else um and i think that's that's definitely something to be encouraged because it leads to better work all around i think from everyone at the end of the day one thing i've seen um several times is and i can totally understand how it happens is that a composer coming into the into the business we we all work at, on projects which are you know low budget um and it's about ensuring that there's income coming in etc but there is there is a transition point sometimes on a project where the the stress levels become such that actually by bringing even one other person in as uh, as a an assistant or a tea maker or um, somebody who can you know go to the shops or um, it, 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 building that sort of support person into the daily life of what the composer is doing and it may only be for the two month pro you know during the time of the project but I mean, it's actually for the composer what's so important is them letting go of actually having to necessarily do everything themselves um, and so often especially in obviously with European budgets in mind you know the composer is also the music editor as as well as all of the other things we were talking about earlier and actually just by saying look we can get someone else you know we can find a budget for that or we can work that out or yes, why don't you get someone to come in and, and they can do some track laying for you when you're not in the studio at night. Um, those sort of things, sort of being able to hand off a few of the things and understand that not keeping, having to keep control directly of every single little piece um, can be, I think, very, very um, uh, enlightening um, and, and make a huge difference to how the composer then feels at the end of the project about the experience that they've had on it. I think that's so true, Maggie. And I, I think, um, you know, that sort of circles back to, um, you know, you're not necessarily even needing an agent. I think if you're, if you're watching this and you're a composer and you don't have an agent, that's really great advice because um, it, not necessarily getting yourself an agent, but just getting someone who can help you out, even with one, one area of your of your work um, can reduce your levels of anxiety and stress and make the whole experience a lot easier, even if it's just getting someone to make your tea for you. <laughs> um, you know, that's one less thing that you have to think about, you know, when you're, when you're doing the job that you've been employed to do, which is to write a score. Um, so yeah, that's really, really great advice. Um, 
I wonder, Maggie, have you, do you find that you take on a more sort of pastoral role for your composers? And have there been any examples of where you've taken on a much more sort of mental support role rather than a practical one? Uh, yes, uh, hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> Over the years, I mean, all sorts of things come up. I mean, if uh, some of the com I mean the conversations I've had with composers over the years have been about all aspects of home life, business, um, creative issues. Um, sometimes it's you know can I can I send you a piece of music? Can you listen to it? Tell me what you think. Um, other times it's um, you know if a composer does feel totally overwhelmed, having a having a discussion about how how we can how it can make things you know less stressful and and um i think it 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 is a that thing of sharing the information as well being able to feel that somebody will come and share with you if they've got a an issue i i always say um and feel very strongly that the composer agent relationship is one of total trust on both sides and yes I, I mean we become very good friends with the composers that that we represent and those friendships last but it's it, that bring that comes from the trust as well that it's if there is an issue let's talk about it rather than bottle it up and try and deal with it yourself and equally if you know if we've you know if we see something and we we can see that there's a roadblock coming or that there's we, we've got alarm bells ringing for some reason or another then we we would contact we'd be in touch with the composer saying look this looks to me like this could get crunch, you know a bit crunchy time wise or we're getting some feedback that you know we, we we ought to be discussing and we ought to be looking at how we can reorganize things to get over these points so it, it it's one of total trust on both sides and then then it is a real support network um and and i and i do think i know you touched upon it before um n not all composers do have agents and the, and and that isn't if that isn't a bad thing there i mean apart from anything else there aren't really enough agents in this world to to handle the work of all the composers there are in this world but there's there's also the thing that for some composers they they absolutely do like to be totally in in control of every single aspect and feel much happier looking after themselves but i'd say to those composers it, it's so important that they then bring others in that they they can have that mentorish type conversation with um, somebody that they can um, bounce ideas off and whether it's meeting and having a drink with somebody or going out for a coffee or you know coming out of the studio because the other thing about the composer world is that by the nature of the work it's it's a lonely work it's people being by themselves in a way it's how we can help make more interaction with other people that then becomes a support network as well um, and and I, and I I think it's also that the, the feeling that one's always got to be working is is actually not a very helpful thing for for people to take away from the business um, I, I was once at um, an event um, out in the States and I was horrified when I said to a composer, oh, are you going to come to this? There was a social event going on in the evening where I knew there would be lots of the composers coming. And I said, oh, you're going to be there tonight. And he, and he said, no, I, I'm not coming. And I said, how come? And he said, well, he said, he said, it's just that everyone else will have got a job who's there and I haven't got anything I'm working on at the moment. And it was peer pressure of that thing of feeling that because you haven't got a job, then you can't really go out and talk with other other people. And that this is quite a few years ago, but it really brought home to me how lonely the job of a composer is, but also how important it is for people to understand it isn't a bad thing if you haven't got a job, because actually you need a recharge time, you need time to go out to the theatre to or in better times or go to you know watch a film or talk with other people and that 
that time in between projects is so incredibly valuable but people I think there's a feeling that composers don't like to admit that they've not got a job on at the moment but in fact I think they should be celebrating <laughs> that they've got a bit of time off and that you know that they're, <clears throat> they're going to read a book that they've always wanted to read or to listen to some new music. I think that is so so crucial um, what you're saying now absolutely and I think also amongst composers there's this weird created pressure that you want to be showing you know that you're working or that you've got the next thing and then what you kind of learn along the way is that everyone has gaps between jobs you know and that is that is exactly the downtime you need to recover um, but being able to just be okay with that and say you know what yeah I worked really hard the last three months and now I don't have anything for a few weeks and it's great rather than having the Kind of internal freak out of like oh god that means i'm not good enough or oh god i'm never <laughs> going to get a job again you know like and and that is something that's not said enough i feel and so yeah i just wanted to say that is brilliant i agree with everything you just said i think um i think yeah i i mean the music industry the wider music industry um has historically you've touched on this earlier ashley has historically had this sort of um, you know, everyone coming up through the ranks needs to pay their dues and like you said, work through the night or not have a break or needs to always be working. And, and I think for a long time, there was this sort of attitude that if you wanted to get into music, then you've got to be prepared to do all these things. And I think we're now, I think that we're now in a generation of, um, of people, I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I certainly did that. You know, I worked for free a lot and I felt that I needed to give my services for free um, in order to get to where I wanted to go to. And I think now that that generation has sort of graduated to, to more sort of senior levels in the industry, I think we're actually finding that there's a, there are different attitudes now. And, it's, and I think we're more nurturing and more caring. And it's actually, we went through that, but I don't think the next generation sort of deserve to have to go through that. I think we need to actually create a, a, a more nurturing environment and um, an easier one for people to work in. And actually, I think we would we'll get better work from people if we do that. You know, if you if you book a big job, I I, I heard this from someone the other day, a really big TV producer who's a freelancer. When they book a really big job, the first thing that they know they're, they're going to it's going to be for about six months. The first thing they do is book a holiday at the end of those six months because they know that they're working towards it and they, it's going to force them to take some time off in between, in between jobs. And that, and that gives them a fresh mindset when they start the new job. It, it gives them a light at the end of the tunnel when things get really difficult. And, um, and I think that's really great advice. And I think it's, it, it, it's true. You, you don't need to be working all the time, particularly when you are working. It's not a nine to five, you know, it's, you, you give your all to it. And, and it, especially in creative jobs, it, there's a, there's a huge part of yourself that goes into it as well. It's not just, you know, admin, it, it's, it's, it's a big part of yourself and that can be very mentally draining. Um, hey, Mitch, I think you, were you going to say yeah. something? <laughs> well, I was just, I mean, I totally agree with what, what everyone's been saying. And, and, um, and the, that's why, you know, it's a bit of a call out really why it's things like arts funding is so important because, we really need to be supporting people at the beginning stages of their careers because that's the most difficult. And, you know, if we're not doing that, um, people are going to have to take on all these jobs just to pay their way because it's difficult. And if we're not, if we can support those people, then we're going to get a much more diverse range of talent coming through as well, which is key for the culture of our country as a whole. And, um, you know, and I think that it will, it will eliminate that kind of that real anxiety about, where 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 are you gonna pay your rent? And I think it doesn't help people. It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't um doesn't it, it's, it's, uh, you know it doesn't help the growth of the industry. And I think that that's you know an important thing that we all could probably do better together. And it's something that you know we need to lobby to the government and we need to put in pr measures in place to really support people in that because if we can eliminate that that you know that 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 issue of having to take on work all the time then, um, you know, that's going to really help composers in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, 
I think it, it's really important. I think if if you're watching this as a as a young composer just starting out, I think it's really important to um, even just to Google, you know, what's available to me um, as someone coming into the industry. Um, and I think something a, a reoccurring theme that comes back time and time again is is collaboration and spreading the um, spreading the, the the job across various people who can help you and are willing to help you. Um, find out what support there is out for you, whether that's um, professional support, financial support, um, all of that can contribute to um, a much more rounded um, way of working and, um, and a much happier work-life work balance as well. Um, and that actually, that, that goes for people who are well into their careers as well as people who are just starting out as well. Um, I think we're gonna wrap up there. Um, but thank you everybody so much for your time. Um, it's been a really interesting chat and hopefully um, everybody who's watching will find it useful and helpful in some way.